Well, hi, and welcome to the Dallas Film Podcast. My name is Tony Armour, and we are really excited to have uh, amazing cinematographer Scott Peck with us today. Scott, thanks for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me. Yeah, so, um, you know, it's fun. We've, uh, we've had a variety of uh, people on the podcast, but we seem to be getting this trend of cinematographers ever since we had Roger Deakins, I think. You know, now, anytime a cinematographer sees we had Roger Deakins, they're like, well, if you guys had Roger, certainly. It's a tough follow-up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're not the episode right after <laughs> yeah, him. Good, so good. Maybe you know, next year. <laughs> that's right. You're, so you're good to go. You know, you're good to go. Uh, but I wanted to really just start out talking a little bit about your career in general and what you've been working on over the years. And you've really found a niche as a, as a television uh, cinematographer over, you know, many years here. So and just kind of let the audience know who you are and, and what you do. Yeah, great. Um, you know, I started my film career at 19. I grew up in California. I uh, started out as a camera assistant and started shooting independent stuff in school. Uh, and on the side. And I kind of had these two careers going at once, an independent shooter and a camera assistant career that eventually kind of merged. So I was working on a TV series. Uh, I became the second unit DP. And kind of from there, I was able to segue into uh, episodic television, which has been uh, fantastic. Yeah. What was the series you were working on? Uh, the first one where I became the second unit DP was, uh, it was called uh, Moonlight, which was a vampire show back at Warner Brothers back in maybe... Oh man, it's been a while. Probably, you know, maybe the last strike, actually, maybe two thousand twelve. Oh, okay, yeah, I think it was or eight with the writer strike. Oh, sorry, yeah, eight. Yes, yeah. yes, it was then. We yeah. shut down, and then we ended up going back. Okay, so many. There have been so many shows over the years that last like one season or so many episodes that you just literally never heard of, and then just kind of disappear. What uh, I get that makes me think. What is probably the most obscure show maybe you've worked on over the years that? Uh, would it be Moonlight, that particular one? Or is there no, some, there's something one, else? that one actually had a pretty good following. Yeah. It only did one season, but it had like a People's Choice Award. So oh, nice. it, it did have a lot of viewers. So I'm not sure why it didn't continue. But uh, the most obscure. Oh, man, I think I've kind of put those out of my brain. I don't know. <laughs> you will have to do a deep dive yeah. on, your, on your IMDb. Yeah. And be like, oh, I forgot I even worked on that yeah. one. Yeah. yeah, I think you tend to remember the good ones and not so much the bad ones. Yeah. Is there, is there a favorite of the, of the bunch? Um, you know, I've been pretty fortunate to work on some pretty cool shows, uh, you know, from Fear the Walking Dead, uh, Doom Patrol, uh, Turn Washington Spies was a really cool one on yeah. AMC. You know, so I've really been kind of blessed to work on things that are different, uh, and very interesting too. Yeah. And Turn Washington Spies, that's cool because that's a period piece. It's, you know, Revolutionary War era and everything like, um, what's it, what's it like? kind of taking that difference of working on something that's like a period piece versus a Doom Patrol that's a superhero show. You know, those are obviously two different uh, sensibilities. Um, maybe just talk a little bit about, you know, kind of what goes into the prep and the actual shooting for something and the look of, say, period piece like that versus, you know, you know, heightened superhero action kind of thing. Yeah, I think what's interesting is the approach is somewhat similar where, you know, you, you read the script, you talk to the director and you sort of game plan what you're going to do. I think the, the subtle variations are in the, the lighting, the contrast, the filtering of the camera, uh, things like that. I mean, I think for the most part, it, it's pretty similar. I think what I always find funny is, you know, people think they see your work. You can only do that kind of work. Yeah. Like you couldn't do comedy or you couldn't. <laughs> it's like, you know, I could make the light a little brighter. You know, it, it really isn't that much different. Right, right. Yeah, especially, you know, I, I like, and this was something that um, Roger Deakins had mentioned, and I, I've always thought the same thing for years, and he verbalized it well, was, you know, when you see something that's like a period piece, and they make it all like sepia tone, and he's like, you know, in reality, uh, it wasn't sepia tone when it was actually happening. <laughs> you know, that is, it was the same color that it is right now that you and I are looking at each other or whatever, like our eyes saw it the same back then, so why are we making everything sepia tone just because it's you know, taking place 200 years ago or, or whatever it might be. And I thought that was, that was pretty funny. Yeah, it is a good point. Yeah. Um, so uh, Fear the Walking Dead was a Texas uh, show that shot uh, Austin. Where, where did that? That shot it, in a few different places. Yeah, it kind of, it was all over the place. It started yeah. in Los Angeles, moved to Mexico, Baja, Mexico, came to Austin, and then I think it ended up in Georgia. Okay. The season I did was in Mexico. Gotcha. Yeah. What was that like shooting in uh, shooting Mexico? It was a great experience. Yeah. You know, it was a, just a massive production. And a majority of the crew was from Mexico. Mm -hmm. So it just, 
you know, the, there was language barriers, the logistics, just very different from working in the United States. But, you know, just those challenges are, are really fun and I think made it worthwhile. Yeah. Where, where in Mexico did you shoot? Uh, we were in Baja. We, in Baja. We, sh we shot at the stages where they did Titanic. Okay. Uh, yeah. We were there in kind of the surrounding areas there. Yeah. That's, uh, that's very cool. Yeah, it's 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 interesting when you look at shows like that. Um, is there is there something in your resume that people see and they're like, "Ooh, I've loved that show." Like that was the one that people really identified with. Yeah, it's interesting. I feel like Turn Washington Spies is oh, the really? thing that most people respond to. Interesting. Yeah, I'm always surprised by that. It's been a while since I've done that one, but mm -hmm. that one continues to kind of come up. Yeah. So you know, television, the structure and the way that that shot is much different from. Big feature films, indie feature films, just film uh, in general. Can you talk a little bit about like kind of how that structure works? Because you are, you've got X number of episodes to shoot, and it's not the way it used to be, right? Where you're doing 22 episodes a season, and like people are just grinding for six months to get these things done. But it's still a different kind of setup. Can you, you know, kind of talk us through and you know, sort of explain to the audience like what is a structure of a TV series shoot like compared to say, a, you know, a feature film? Yeah, I think the biggest thing it is it is a bit of a machine. Uh, I would say there's a lot of meetings. You know, there's always meetings. And as a DP, a lot of shows now have, now have two DPs. Mm. So you alternate episodes. Interesting. Which I think is, is good. It's, it's good for the director because you're there to support the director in the show. It gives you more time to kind of figure out what you're going to do and, and you know, kind of navigate any difficulties that might come up. So I think as far as that goes, there are a lot of meetings. You basically... You know, you go, you shoot one episode, okay, you're right back the, the next work day, you're back in prep, you're reading the script, you're meeting about, you know, the story, you're meeting about the costumes, the props. I, I just, there's so many meetings, I yeah. can't even know. It's like, <laughs> and how, how many are you, are you like, because every, everything's different though, is it like eight shoot days? Like how many days do you get it to actually varies, shoot? It varies from show to show. I, I think now you'll find, uh, you know, they can be six days. Eight days. Eight days was kind of the norm for a while as mm -hmm. far as like cable television and I think network television. But with streaming and some of these higher end, bigger shows, I mean, they could be 12 days. They could be, I mean, I've heard of like some of these HBO shows being 20, 20 days. Sure. And that's, uh, and it's interesting too, because you think about it, you know, a typical, whatever, it's not an hour television, right? I mean, that's the old model of an hour, but minus commercials. So you're, you're, you're anywhere... 40, 45, 50, 55 minutes sometimes. It's all kind of all over the board for, for each episode. But you're doing that in, let's just say it's eight days. That's right. You know, And if two of those back-to-back, -back, you've shot a feature film at a really high level in 16 days, yeah. basically. Yeah. Which is, that's a crazy fast schedule. That, those are like the $200,000 indie film schedules that they shoot on is, you know, small Lifetime Channel movies. Uh, even Hallmark Channel movies, those are like 12, 13-day shoots, right? 15 maybe. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think that's a great, it's a great uh, learning ground for television. I did a bunch of those Lifetime movies earlier in my career. And yeah. Same kind of thing where it's like 13 days. And you, you, you get used to working fast. You get used to making decisions quickly and, and kind of adapting as you go. Yeah. But the shows still look good. That I think that's kind of the point is, and it's not like, um, like, like I'm a huge fan of, you know, Miami Vice back in the day and the old Magnum PI and shows like that. And obviously they look a lot different now than they do then. And there are stylistic uh, things that if you would see something, you're like, oh, that's a, if you see like an indie feature film, you could say, oh, that, that's a, that's a TV director that shot that. Because, you know, if you have those two characters who are standing one facing the other person's back and they're shooting at the same time and they're both looking at the camera. It's not a natural way to have a conversation, right? But it's very, very much an old way that television was shot so you don't have to turn around all the time. You just have them both face the camera and have one stand over the other person's shoulder. But television now and really in the last, you know, 10, 15 years or so has become much more cinematic. And so how do you maintain that cinematic look and feel in eight days trying to shoot something when somebody else would shoot that in? 21 or 22 or whatever it might be yeah i think that's a great question i think you you when you go through the script you pick and choose where to spend your time mm -hmm. i think it's crucial it's like okay this scene is really important and why and okay you know you're going to spend however many hours shooting it or a day or whatever it is then you know this scene not as important the actors you know they can just read the lines real quick and walk and talk and let them out of the frame and you have it. Right. Yeah. So I think it just becomes a creative decision uh, where you want to put that energy. Yeah. And, and, uh, and so you as a cinematographer on a lot of these shows, you're not also operating. You've got separate operators where you're just making sure everything's 
lights are set and everything's the way it needs to be. What's that like then, um, say, from a lens choice perspective? Are you still deciding lenses, but that's in conjunction with the director? Talk a little bit, maybe, you know, I know I'm getting maybe a little weedsy as far as shooting goes, but we do have a cinematographer on the episode, so I think we can we can do that. No, this is good. I, I think for me, lensing is a, a crucial part of being a cinematographer. I think it, it definitely is one of the most enjoyable parts. It's understanding the lens choice, what it means, not only how it looks, but what it says. Mm -hmm. So I think that part I hold on real close. So when I'm setting up a shot, I'm with the director, I have the operators nearby, you know, I'm looking at lenses, looking at frames, definitely, you know, it, it definitely goes through me. I mean, the director might be like, oh, I want to see this, but I'll decide what focal length I put on the camera. Okay. That's, so in, that's, that's interesting. Cause I was going to say, you know, you have, um, a, a visual aesthetic that you're maintaining through a whole series but you have different directors for the most part for every episode. Sometimes you'll have the same director who do multiple episodes, of course, so they'll bounce episodes. Like you said, you've got two cinematographers and you alternate as you, so you can move quicker or whatever. Um, what's it like working with a different director every single week and trying to, cause, you know, you have to learn their style and what they want fresh every single week, even though the show has its own feel? Yeah, I think for me, when I started shooting television, that was probably the hardest thing to adapt to. It's, you know, from each episode, you have to kind of, you know, be malleable and be, you know, what do they need from you? What, what support do you need to give them? Because certainly some directors have a stronger skill set than others mm -hmm. for certain things. So you have to kind of uh, feel out where you fit in and how much you can push and how much, you know, you need to just, you know, basically listen to what they're telling you to right. do. Right. Sometimes you'll have the, the actor's director who just wants to work with the actors and I don't care about the camera. Yeah, that's your job, right? You do the camera. I'm just going to work with these actors and make sure I'm getting the performances you know, that I want versus somebody who might be really hands-on and wants to, you know, I want this particular lens and that kind of thing. Yeah, definitely. I think, um, I think what's so fun about shooting television is you do become such an integral part of the show where it's not to say that it's your show, mm -hmm. but, but you become the kind of the anchor yeah. of the production team when you're shooting, you know, people go to you with the questions, they kind of know who to ask and where to get the answer. Yeah. It almost, it almost makes me think of why even bother having a new director every episode to that point? You know, it's kind of like, well, if we're going to get a new person every episode and we have the same team that's been doing it, why don't we just keep this same team through the whole season? What's the point of a new director every episode? Did you ever think that or other people discuss it like on set? Yeah, I think that, I think that certainly comes up. I think you do see certain shows that kind of have the same group of people, but mm -hmm. I think also having new ideas, a fresh perspective. Yeah. I think that's what's great about what we do. I think more voices. Yeah, I think that's a that's a really good point because I imagine, especially if you're doing multiple seasons of something, it could get stale real fast if it's the same sort of perspective on on everything from from an episode to episode basis. Yeah, and I think, you know, people, you know, when they work, they come to a new job, they're usually pretty excited about it. Yeah. There's that enthusiasm, the hunger, it's 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 there. You know, I think if you get stuck in one place you can kind of get used to it and complacent and, and not push. Yeah. You know, I think you always need to be pushing to be yeah. the best it can be. Do you ever get, uh, you know, you hear, how, how, like how far in advance do you know who, who the director is going to be? Is it, does it like you find out the right before? You no, know that... it's usually, it's booked well in advance. Well in so advance. typically if I start a series, I'll, I'll probably know at least probably 75% of who the directors will yeah. be for the season. You ever look at the list and be like, oh, this guy. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> The truth, truthfully, yes. But, yeah. but you don't have to say I, names. Yeah, you know? yeah, no. Truthfully, yes. But uh, I, I think all in all, you know, I have a pretty good uh, experience working with directors. Sure, that yeah. part's fun. You're a professional, so you know you're gonna do you're gonna do your job. But I, I'm sure there's many people on set who look at that list and be like, really? Oh yeah. You, you're bringing in you're bringing in this person. Oh yeah. I mean, I think what's funny about the crew, crews love to complain, and they they also everybody thinks they know better than somebody else. Yeah. So especially when it comes to directing, right? You know, I think. People don't realize how hard that job can be. Yeah. So I think, you know, you have to give them a little leeway. Yeah, no, of course. And, I, yeah, and you're right. I think that is a part of, of just being on set is crew complaining. Because I, I, sometimes I feel like that's how just some people get through their day. It's like, it's just what it is, is the food's not good enough. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you hear that a lot. The food's never good yeah. enough, you know. I mean, why don't we have Ruth Chris uh, catering here today? Like, who bring in some steak and, uh, uh, yeah. That, but that's all. That, to, to me, that always seems to be like whenever I'm on set, that's always like the the first thing and the biggest one is always about the food. If you can, if you can nail that, 
you're doing pretty good with the rest of the crew. They'll let other things slide as long as you as long as you feed them well. Yeah, true. <laughs> the food and the hours, those are the things. Yeah, of course. Hear about. Yeah, I mean, everybody likes making overtime, but nobody actually likes working overtime. Yeah, exactly. And how how often do you feel like you uh you go into overtime on a on a TV series? Is it like con- is it every day when no, you're shooting? No, it's not. It, you know, it used to be like that. Yeah, I, I would say in the last three to four years, it's it's definitely gotten better. Yeah, uh, particularly in the last couple of years since the last uh, IOTC contract. Oh yeah, it, it got much better. That's good. You know, typically on a TV show on a Friday. You know you're working till Saturday morning. Right. That was like the norm. Yeah. But that definitely has been scaled way back. They did a nice job with that. Sure. Yeah. Because yeah, that used to be how they would how they would get you. Right. Is they you know you wrap early enough on a Thursday to get that turnaround so that then they can, I can't what was it called? That's there's like a term for it. Um, yeah, I forget. But I forget what it is. We can turn around. Yeah. Some it, something yeah. where they could they would basically screw you so that you end up working really t- essentially early on a Saturday morning and you got that day off. But it wasn't much of a day off because you'd work so late. Yeah, you would basically wrap it at uh, you know five thirty uh, Saturday morning, mm-hmm. and then you would be back at work seven a.m. Monday. Yeah, yeah, that's not really a weekend. No, that's rough. It's just <laughs> yeah, that's a hard way to do it. Yeah. Well, you know, so you mentioned IATSE. Um, there's a IATSE contract coming up later this summer. You know, I mean, without saying or whatever, you nobody knows. Like, what do you what do you think? is uh you know how's how's this gonna play out yeah it's tough you know i i don't want to say too much but yeah but certainly uh you know i think they have some general you know some genuine concerns sure certainly ai is the talk of everything job security is such a thing uh but the business just feels so unstable right now yeah you know people are out of work i know so many people out of work it's, yeah it's pretty devastating yeah from what from what i'm hearing it's you know of course, you have uh, strikes are over, and then it was the holidays, and so nothing's going to happen holidays. Now it's the beginning of the year, and people are waiting on, well, if we don't spend money yet out of this year's budget, as far as like studios and things like that go, we can push this towards the end of the year. Okay, shows are getting canceled. We're going to you know, bring this thing back that we started, and we need to finish it, but nothing new is going what are you what are you hearing i'm hearing the same thing i mean it it feels like all the shows that are back were shows that were already about to go Mm -hmm. before strike so now everyone's just kind of waiting to see what happens i mean obviously there's a bunch of restructuring and a new landscape ahead and everyone's kind of waiting to see what that looks like yeah you know we hear fewer jobs uh it's what do they say it's uh quality over quantity yeah which which i get um yeah just hopefully there's enough to to go around i mean it's kind of scary right now yeah no it is and i'm curious i haven't really read because i don't think it's been publicized too much yet like what iotc's concerns are going to be for this next contract um because you, you talk about ai okay you can see ai for writers right like all right we don't want ai writing our scripts but ai is not going to repl- replace the wardrobe person like ai is not going to be a robot out there walking around you know doing wardrobe or or art department or you know script supervisor or a lot of these roles can't be replaced by AI. So I'm curious, like, what the, um, what is the IATSE AI concern? I'm not, I mean, you probably don't. I, I think I it's a little, you know, I don't think it's the concern in the next four years, yeah. but it's, you know, the concern in the next 10 years. Sure. I mean, it's, it's advancing so fast that I think people don't fully understand what the capabilities are mm-hmm. and where that's going. So I think people are just concerned. Yeah. Yeah, we'll find, I guess we'll find out. It's, that'd be hard to write into a contract, right? Like, if you're like, we don't know, but we just want to make sure that we don't lose something that we don't know about yet. Yeah, it, it's, uh, I don't really know what, what exactly the major bullet points are for yeah. this next contract. I think those discussions are going on now. Uh, I haven't read anything, you know, recently where it's kind of highlighted what those are. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to oh. say, move your microphone oh. just a little bit more. Yep. No, there it yeah, is. There you go. Thank you. No, no problem. Um, yeah, so we were talking a little bit before we started, uh, recording and oh, I always do that way. I start having those conversations be like, we should wait until we're recording to, uh, to discuss this kind of stuff, but kind of like the, the trend where, you know, projects have gone nowadays. So, you know, stuff's getting canceled or there's always a complaint. People, people always for, for a hundred years have said, well, it's not as good now as it, as it used to be, but big, but there, yeah. it, it definitely feels like quality has really declined uh you know we had that you know whatever it was peak television with you know when you had Mad Men and some like really great shows that were on all at the same time and now you kind of look at stuff and it's like and i can see why streamers and everybody else is cutting back on what they're making because they're like 
why would I make it if it's not good? What do you, I mean, what do you think sort of some of the reasons are for just so much garbage? <laughs> you know what it is? I, I think, not to trash anything, yeah, but, no, but certainly okay. there's just, there is so much content. No one listens to this anyway, so there's not There's so hear much it. content <laughs> that, you know, how can all of it be great? Yeah. It's just not, just not uh, possible or sustainable, I think. There's certainly some amazing television out there yeah. at a very high level. I think it's just, there's so much, and I think it just falls short is the problem. Because now they're spending so much money making some of these shows, and mm -hmm. they're still just a little, eh, yeah. didn't quite deliver. I mean, there's no substitute for great scripts, right? Yeah. I mean, I think ultimately the writing has to be on point, and you know, people will, will go with it, regardless of how great it looks or who's in it. The writing is good. It's going to be a good show. Yeah, no, I agree with you there. I think that is such a big part of it. You know, they, um, you know, they did the new, uh, the new Lord of the Rings series on Amazon, and then of course they did the new Game of Thrones series on HBO. Because you know, you got to ride the coattails of all the old stuff that did really well, and obviously not as well received. And I watched both of them, and I, same kind of thing. I'm kind of like, eh, yeah, yeah, they're fine, you know, whatever. But it doesn't doesn't capture that same magic that was so good about, you know, I mean. Peter Jackson, it's hard to replicate what he did with those original films anyways. Like, how can you? Um, but even like the Game of Thrones series, it, it wasn't, it's not like it was that 10 years ago when that thing wrapped up, like it just finished and they were like, okay, we need, we need more. What can we do to, to make more? And so it's interesting how you can have sort of same, same, but different. And it's just not, not good or, or not as good as, as something that came along before. Yeah. It's like catching lightning in a bottle. Hard to do it. Hard to do it more than once. Yeah. You know, there, there's something special about those particular series you know, in its originality or original series mm -hmm. that it just had that it quality, whatever it was. Yeah. It's hard to replicate that. Well, so here's a good segue. So those were effects heavy series. And so you've worked on some shows that obviously had to have effects from Fear the Walking Dead to Doom Patrol, Stargirl, you know, what's it, um, talk a little bit about what it's like when you're working on an effect show like that. Like what sort of additional planning has to go into, you're setting up a particular shot and you know, you know, laser bolts going to come out of the hand. They're going to fly this effect or this thing is going to happen. Like, how are you shooting that in a way that is supporting visual effects later on? Or, you know, what sort of pre-planning goes into all of that? Yeah. I think a lot of discussions that go around it are the camera movement. Mm -hmm. Typically if the camera movement is, is uh, pretty severe, it makes the effects work a lot harder. Yeah. So oftentimes, you know, money is always at the <laughs> at the top, right? So we have X amount of money for the visual effects. So in prep, you kind of go through all the shots and sequences and talk about what the effects are going to be, what you need to plan for, because they actually do a budget for every effect shot mm -hmm. per the episode. So you kind of know ahead of time where they're going to be. Yeah. Lock this camera down. <laughs> Do not shake it. Yeah. We don't want to have to track it. Yeah. Luckily, there's not a lot of that. I think those days, at least on those types of shows, you know, nobody will get away with saying that. Yeah. You know, yeah. as much as a, a visual effects supervisor would want that because he knows it's going to be easy and cheap, uh, you well, can't do that. The technology has gotten a lot better from the VFX side to be able to track that without, you know, the way that you Absolutely. Do and I think also, like, you know, the viewer is expecting something mm -hmm. a little more sophisticated. You know, yeah. it's it just shows are at really high high quality, high scale now. So you have to deliver to make it look good, interesting. People have expectations now. So yeah. you have to deliver that. Yeah, I remember this is gonna this is gonna age myself with this comment here. But watching the old uh Hulk T V series back in the late seventies, you know, and there was one like one episode where it was like a split screen where it was like the Hulk on screen at the same time as Lou Ferrigno or something. And like that was like, oh my God, how did they get the Hulk and Lou Ferrigno both on screen next to each other at the same at the same time? And now like it's so, you know, so easy to do things like that. But that was like a momentous, you know, oh my God, that's that's crazy. <laughs> yeah, that's fun. Uh, it makes me think too, you know, talking about like superhero shows and effects and things like that. Um, I would almost rather see a giant bodybuilder painted green than like the digital Hulk running around you know smashing things or whatever because there's still even though the effects are great you still look at it and you, you just know it's animated right you're like you're watching a cartoon basically it's it's supposed to be live action but you're you know still watching a cartoon um i don't know if i had a question in particular other than what are your thoughts about i, I agree you know, i agree completely i mean there's no substitute for a real actor the real interaction 
I think for me personally, I know the Marvel movies over time, they've sort of tailed off a little yeah. bit. For me, they became too visual effects heavy mm -hmm. where I lost that connection with the characters and, you know, there, there's less stuff that happens on Earth. It's more like in these other planets and stuff. And to me, that loses me a little bit. Yeah. You know, I want something that's a little more grounded, personal, uh, and more real. And I think at a certain point when you have too many CG characters and too much visual effects, it's easy to get lost with that stuff and just not believe it. Yeah, and I think the personal stories are ones people connect with more. There's a reason that the Spider-Man films always do well. It's just about a guy who's struggling through life and happens to have superpowers, right? He's not always trying to save the world. And the same thing when the first Daredevil movie, Daredevil movie came, or not Daredevil, I'm sorry, but the um, uh, Deadpool, the other D uh, yeah. character. And when the first Deadpool film came out, yes, it was rated R and funny and all that kind of stuff. But he just wanted to get back with his girlfriend. Like, that was literally the story. He just wanted to get back with his girlfriend. That was it. And then everything else happens around it. And people can identify with that so much more than, oh, the world's going to end again. Yeah, no doubt. A simple storyline. People can connect with that. It has a human element that everybody can relate to. Yeah. Those, those to me, are the ones that, you know, that I want to see more than, uh, more than anything else. Again, maybe, maybe it's a sign of aging where I, <laughs> I want to see these grounded you know, based in, uh, based in reality kind of stuff. I, I think also, I think maybe th that is just so saturated now. Yeah. Hopefully with, with everything that's happening in the business, there's going to be a little bit of a, a resurgence of independent film, you know, more original stories. We're not chasing the, you know, the, the huge IP, the big tent pole movie. Uh, I think, you know, more grounded human stories. Hopefully people will get another chance to kind of experience those. Well, if studios want cheaper budgets, uh, that's one way to do it. Absolutely. You know, is, is, is not spend so much money on effects. Well, for, for you personally, what are, like, what's a dream project for you? Like, what is something that, you know, obviously besides the next paying job? Um, <laughs> it is like that right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, what, what is, you know, something, whether it's something that already exists that you would just love to work on or something new and fresh and original that I would like to work on, you know, something like this kind of thing? Yeah, good question. I, I think my personal, uh, my aesthetic and the types of projects I really like to watch the most would be uh, like an international crime thriller, something like that. I love, you know, James Bond type stuff. I like stuff where it takes you to other countries and mm -hmm. you see things that you don't typically get to see every day. I think for me, that intrigues me. Yeah. I mean, I grew up on Bond as well. And so, you know, that's, 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 that's like the ultimate dream, right? Like one day, if I could be a part of a James Bond movie, like that's, that would be the ultimate goal. It's like, I can die and retire now. You know, I, I, I did this. Yeah, I think that would be a lot of fun. But I think the other thing, just now that I'm here in Dallas, like I'm really intrigued by all these Taylor Sheridan shows. Yeah, I think sure. it'd, be, it'd be a lot of fun to do, you know, a Western or something, something that's really about Texas would be really cool. Yeah, I know um, he's got uh, Land Man, the, uh, the show with Billy Bob Thornton starting up. And from what I've read, there is, of course, there was like... Uh, Yellowstone, 1883, 1923, there's like a 1940-something one. I don't know if it's going to do 43 or 44, whatever year they're picking. There's a 40-something one. They probably have plans for something in the 60s. Like, there's so many of those shows. Yeah. Like, it'd be, it would be great to get more. I, I don't know what the, what the capability is of doing more than one at a time locally, you know, but at the same time, it, it'll take 100 years to tell. Yeah, that's a lot of shows. He's created quite a universe of, of shows, which is really cool and exciting. I think... It'd be amazing to get more stuff here to Texas. To, to your point, it, yeah. it seems like maybe it is only a one crew, two crew town. But with as many people that are moving here mm -hmm. and the growth that's happening here, I could really see it becoming something bigger. I would really like it to. I've spent a lot of time in Atlanta and kind of saw that grow and what that became. You know, to me, there's no reason it couldn't be the same here. Yeah. It, well, it is literally the definition of my job to bring more projects to Texas. Part of why we do this podcast so people can hear this and be like, you know, where would be great to go shoot Dallas. That sounds like a fun, fun spot. So anyone that's listening that wants to come to Dallas, you know, please come <laughs> re reach out because it really it really is. We'll give the, the Dallas shout out on here. It really is such an amazing uh, location for productions. That was part of the reason I took this job a year ago was I was like, why isn't Dallas bigger? Like, why isn't it Atlanta? Why isn't it? I mean, Albuquerque, New Mexico, for God's sakes has like a ton of production and yes it's all incentive based like what are the incentives but now that texas has 200 million okay 
let's you know let's roll here let's get thing let's get things going and that's one of the things i was like why isn't it because it is dallas is such a sort of a dynamic city and area and fourth largest in the country going to overtake chicago whatever all the numbers are um to me it, it it's weird that it doesn't have this massive industry that it should or could have yeah well hopefully with the incentives that uh in in the business picking up again we can see uh, more stuff come here yeah now i know we talked to you and i offline personally talked about it a little bit but what what is it that brought you to dallas uh from california because obviously you you know grew up in california and you know chose to relocate to uh to texas basically yeah i think for me it, my family we were ready to leave uh you know we wanted a place that was centrally lo- centrally located because i was traveling so much mm-hmm. but also just a, a better place to raise our family and we came here we love it you know i wish i lived here longer yeah it's, it's really is a great place to live yeah yeah it is it is i, I like i like it a lot um i'm gonna go back to nerdy technical questions again you know from a sort of a camera perspective uh everyone seems to be shooting on the alexa for everything uh what did you guys shoot on and most of the series that you're working on you know for me it varies it yeah. uh it really jumps around i've, I've used the alexa Let, let's try and pinpoint exactly for each show let's see doom patrol we use the reds okay red monstro uh this last show i did called average joe on uh, Paramount and BT Plus, I use the Venice Two, the Sony. Okay, yeah. Uh, it, it usually depends on the rental house, the budget, mm-hmm. availability, that sort of thing. Uh, prior to using the Red, I use the Alexa mm-hmm. tons of times. It it varies. I think different camera, different lenses helps give the show a different look. Yeah. So I'm always kind of trying to mix it up. Yeah. So what do you? So I know the. You know, the thing that people always say about the Alexa is, you know, just something about skin tone. Skin tones are always better on the Alexa. And I'm like, eh, is that really true? I mean, you know, it, it, the cameras and the sensors are so good nowadays and you can manipulate things so much in post-production with color and everything else. Um, you know, Alexa, Red, it's, it's a tool, right? Yeah, very much so. They're all very good. You know, those are all excellent cameras, excellent sensors. To me, when I think of Alexa, it's it feels just a little softer, mm-hmm. has a little smoother, softer quality in the sure. image, which is really nice. Uh, I would say the Sony is a little crisper. Yeah. Um, and then I think the Red is somewhere in between, but all great tools, great cameras. Yeah. And I, I always lose track of like whatever whatever sensor they're on with the Red. Like it's the Monstro. It's the... I mean, I couldn't even name off all the different ones because they literally seems like they change it on a year to year basis. I don't know how they keep coming up. Yeah, with I don't know if it's the drag. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, the, red, the, the red dragon, dragon now. Red, uh, yeah. you know, and on and on. And they make so many different. Um, I mean, every you know company makes different camera bodies, but it feels like the red has so many different uh, camera body sizes and everything. Obviously, Alexa has you know the, the full and the mini and whatever else, but um red seems to you know i gotta can't even keep track of how many yeah it's very ones. modular right you can order yeah. it with certain features which i think for somebody who's interested in buying a camera it's kind of good like that yeah as opposed to the sony i guess sony has different classes of camera too but when i think of a cinematic sony camera i gravitate towards the venice sure and i'm assuming you know once you're on a show you're using the same camera for the whole series like because it doesn't make sense to jump around within the same one but or has that has that happened it, it it's happened uh I'm trying to think um it has happened before. I think you might end up the season before on an older camera. Mm-hmm. So the, the next season around, you're looking to use the newer sensor. Sure. So that definitely does happen. And I think occasionally the lenses change also. Or, or even, you know, I've had to change vendors from season to season oh, like right. where we got the camera. So that could affect the lenses, the camera body. I mean, it's, it definitely does happen. Yeah, and I guess depending on where you're shooting, you know, if you're shooting in Atlanta, I would assume Atlanta has a ton of stuff. But depending on the volume of stuff that's going, it's like, okay, we're out. <laughs> like, where are you going to get this from? Yeah, luckily that does happen in Atlanta, but, but usually that point you've already kind of got your camera package. Mm-hmm. And, and a lot of those companies in Atlanta or in Atlanta have offices in LA or right. New York or, or where else. So they can always borrow. Yeah, you're, sort of you're getting stuff from all, from all yeah. over the place. Yeah, kind of thing, which uh, I guess that consistency is, uh, is, is good. Um, what uh any particular location that you've shot in around the world you said you know we'd love to do like a bond film it's gonna be different locations around the world any particular place you've shot or you've been that you like and you talked about mexico you know like that you would just love to go back again or you just had like such an amazing experience you think is uh, just a great place to shoot besides dallas of course being the number one on the list yeah good plug good plug the um 
I did a series or part of a series a couple of years back called Vampire Academy. Yeah. It was in Spain. Oh, cool. So that, that was a really fun experience. You know, uh, my family and I traveled to Pamplona. Yeah. Where they run the bulls. Yeah. So we were there for about five months shooting. It was, it was really a great experience. Did the uh, running the bulls occur during? No, the we got there just after. Oh, yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. We ended up staying in like an apartment, like right in kind of that main street yeah. where you see them run down. Yeah. It was really cool. Yeah, I imagine it'd be in the contract right before the season starts. You are not allowed to run with the bulls. Yeah, no getting gored before. The, <laughs> yeah, before the season yeah. goes. No insurance policy. <laughs> they won't, yeah, they won't nothing is you. nothing is is covering that. How many? Uh, how many seasons of Vampire Academy? It did. did that one did one. One. Because I remember seeing when that came out and actually thinking like, oh, that looks like a fun, interesting kind of show. Uh, and yet I don't remember what channel it was on or platform and uh, what happened to it. It was one of those things like, I guess it was their marketing because I remember seeing it and being like, that looks kind of cool. And then never actually watching it. Yeah. It got a pretty big push, but I think ultimately it just didn't catch on or maybe it was too expensive. Not yeah, sure. I mean, I mean, I, honestly, right? That 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 happens a lot of times. Like, a, a, someone will do a show, and it's so expensive that they're like, "We can't do any more seasons of this. It's just not worth it." Yeah, I think that's really those conversations are, are happening quite a bit right now. Yeah, well, and it's and it's interesting too. Like, you look at um, like a Netflix, who you know their seasons are eight, ten episodes, whatever, whatever it might be, and for a lot of their series, they've over the years they've done like three seasons and they're done and that's it. Like you get three seasons and then we're moving on. And the old model of 22 episodes, if you got three seasons from 22 episodes, I mean, you could be in syndication forever. That's how the original Star Trek series turned into what it did because it only lasted three seasons and, but it was in syndication for so many years and it built this massive following after it was off the air that it was just like became, you know, Star Trek essentially. You know, what do you think about shorter seasons you know would you would you like to work on a 22 episode season on something or you're happy doing these eights and tens because obviously it's more consistent work but you know talk a little bit sort of about the difference of like the the big old school season versus doing the small ones and what your preference would be yeah i think at this point you know stability is is a really nice thing so Mm -hmm. so i would think if it was somewhere in between would be the sweet spot yeah you know i think eight to ten is like okay it's a good run but then you kind of have to worry when am I going to get another job? <laughs> but if you're doing, you know, 10 months out of the year, it's like you can't wait for that time off and you yeah. know you're going to be good for however long that is. So I think somewhere in between would be the sweet spot. Yeah, right. It'd be like, okay, we start shooting in January. We're going to wrap in October. I get to take the end of the year off. That would be uh, that'd be a, a good way to do it. Uh, especially, I think, you know, you look at uh, like Seinfeld or Friends or The Office, these shows that ran for such a long time, it did 22 a season. People are still watching those today, you know. Uh, college kids, high school kids are, are watching Friends that never would have seen it originally and have now built these new fan bases that carry these shows on for 20 years later. Yeah, that's interesting how streaming is, is sort of, uh, you know, taking those shows and really giving them a whole nother life. Yeah, well, uh, just this past year, right, Suits, right? Like Suits became like one of the number one shows on on Netflix and everybody's watching Suits and it has it's been, it's been off the air for years. Yeah, it's uh, – it, it's. It's interesting. It's also kind of a bad, you know, to me, it's almost a bad thing, really, yeah. because like if if these companies are sustained with old shows, you know, why do they need to make as many new shows? So true. it's sort of, you know, the double edged sword. There. No, it's true. But, but it's how, you know, everyone was chasing Netflix and they're like, we've got to be Netflix. We've got to be Netflix and we're going to create our own platform and we're going to keep all our own stuff. And then they do that and they're like, oh, we're not making any money this way. <laughs> it yeah. makes more sense if we do sell it to Netflix and let you guys have it. Yeah. So I just read today that Sex and the City is going to be coming to Netflix. Like the all however many seasons they did of that show. So that's an old catalog that they've had for forever. And they're going to be like, we'll make a couple hundred million on this by just licensing you to Netflix kind of thing. Yeah, wow. It's, uh, Netflix really is at a kind of a level that the other ones just aren't at this point. Yeah. Everybody is chasing that. It, it seems like it makes sense to not really chase it anymore and try and figure out what your business is separate of that. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I think that's a great point. Uh, everyone wanted to be Netflix, and now they're like, oh, maybe we don't have to be. Maybe we could be something different. Yeah, it feels like that destroyed the business. Yeah, uh, because everybody chasing Netflix, it seems like it's completely destroyed what we knew of television. Yeah, because yeah, you're right, because then it flipped everything upside down. All of a sudden, you had streaming platforms, and then the pandemic hit, and everybody just stayed home and watched streaming, and it killed theatrical, 
and it killed longer form, you know, 13 episode seasons or even full 22s. And now everybody's kind of like, oh, now what? Yeah. And, and uh, on that note, you know, everyone was, oh, I don't have to watch commercials anymore. <laughs> well, now Guess everybody's what? watching commercials again. You know, you're paying the same, if not more, uh, than you did with cable and you're watching commercials. So yeah. It's like we really have uh, gone full circle. Yeah, Paramount Plus has commercials. Um, Amazon is now, even though you've, we've been commercial free on Amazon for so long, they're going to start putting commercials into all of their stuff. And then you have like those platforms like Tubi and stuff that have come along that have all, they're free and, so, and they're commercial supported. And they're like, this is just old school television. Yeah. I'm okay with it as long as, yeah. there's, as, long as they start making shows. I'm, right. Yeah, I can long, deal with the commercials. Of course. It means more work for filmmakers, people doing commercials, TV. It's good for everybody. Yeah. So. I'm okay with that. Well, and I think here's the funny thing that people either don't know or they seem to have forgotten. Broadcast television is still free. You just need an antenna, and you can actually watch all of the shows that you are on ABC, NBC, CBS, Fox, and uh, Ion Network. I know that's another one. And CW. Those are all just broadcast. Yeah, I think people did forget about that. They, they had yeah. to have because you could. Yeah. I think the only difference is you can't watch it on a phone because they don't sell like a TV antenna you can plug into your phone. And somebody tried to create that a few years ago and then everybody, I was going to say lost their, you know, over it. I guess I could curse on this podcast if I want to. I mean, <laughs> there's no FCC, FCC regulations. We'll maintain it family friendly though, but everybody just lost their mind over, over that. But I still think like, how great would that be if you could just plug an antenna into your phone? You could just watch regular TV for free on your phone. You're still watching all the commercials that they want you to watch the ratings are higher. I don't understand why, why they would oppose it. Yeah, I don't, I don't either. I wondered if I kind of assumed you could probably go online, you know, sign up, give your email, yeah, make an account on on the you know main network and apps, watch it. I would think it would make sense. But yeah. still, just the old school, you know, broadcast television. So anybody listening that is under the age of forty, <laughs> you can actually watch TV for free still. Just a little note: buy a ten dollar antenna, plug it into your. TV. But that's the problem. They don't have TVs, right? They're just yeah. watching on the Everything's laptop. on the phone or the laptop yeah. or the iPad. It still exists. Yeah. Um, well, Scott, thank you for uh, coming on the uh, on the episode today. Anything you want to talk about before we wrap up here? Uh, no, that was great. It's great to talk to you. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, no, we appreciate it. If anybody needs to hire a cinematographer in Dallas, Scott is here. He's oh, got a ton, please, please hit me up. I'm ton, definitely looking to meet new filmmakers here in town. A ton of television work. Yeah, and that's the thing too. You know, we were actually just talking about that is we should put together some kind of big, you know, filmmaker, you know, crew get together. There are organizations that do that, but there's so many people like yourself who've come here from LA and come from other areas wanting to meet other people that will work on putting something uh, like that together so everybody can everybody can meet and uh Maybe something will come out of it. We'll create some brand new show. Who knows? Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for listening. Scott, why don't you? T what are your um, social handles you want to share with everybody before we go? Uh, I actually don't do any social media. <laughs> My website is uh, www.scottpeckdop.com. Uh, yeah, you can probably find my info in the uh, the Dallas Crew Director, our production guy, yeah. Yeah, on the website. Yeah. yeah. yeah but or most... you, if you go if they Google you, look on IMDb yeah. Scott Peck, they'll yeah. be able to find all your stuff and the yeah. shows you worked on over the years. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thanks, Appreciate everybody. It. Appreciate thanks. it. Thank you.